Tough needs to be asked. Should the Marlins look to do a full-blown rebuild right now? Because for me, this team seems to be going nowhere. You are Locked On Marlins, your daily podcast on the Miami Marlins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings from England and welcome to Locked on Marlins. This is your daily Marlins podcast. I, of course, am your host, Peter Pratt. Hit me up on Twitter, mainly Twitter, no TikToks, no Instas. Twitter at Miami Marlins underscore. If you are listening to the pod, firstly, thank you. Thank you for listening and welcome to the show. Hit subscribe, leave a review. Why not? YouTube, there is a YouTube channel and it is course, Locked on Marlins. All episodes are available there. Solo pod today. It's the Monday episode, the 19th of December. Greetings and welcome to the show. I asked the question at the top, is or are the Marlins approaching a full-blown rebuild again? Should they? Should they do that? I'm going to dig into that. But we need to add some context as to why that question is being asked. Fair to say, hold on a minute. Hit the, hit the pause button a second. The reason we're asking this question is it's Monday, the 19th of December. What have the Marlins done to address their clear deficiencies in the offense and the bullpen? We shouldn't forget the bullpen. I know we focus heavily on the offense, but we, we can't forget that bullpen. Boy, oh boy, blown save after blown save uh, in 22. What have the Marlins done thus far? They've done absolutely nothing. Nothing. It's wild. It's wild, but we we start to have to ask the questions, and this is where we're now at in terms of the, the, the realization. That's the right word. It's a realization moment that actually offensive guys, particularly those that are looking for prove-it deals or to kind of get another deal after maybe their, their time with the Marlins, they don't want to sign with the fish. They don't. The team stinks, and the ballpark hurts them. They don't want to sign. And also the other thing, um, there's no fans either. That doesn't help. Those three factors combined. Yes, the tax situation may be good. Yes, the weather's nice. Yes, all those things. But fundamentally, as a baseball player, and one and that is driven heavily by your, your own individual performances and your numbers that you put up, those, those elements drive the value of your contracts and your future contracts. The reality is the offensive guys... They don't want to sign with the Marlins because the ballpark hurts them. There's no fans around and the team's not doing well. All of those things do not help. Why are we asking, why are we having this conversation? Why is it so topical right now? It comes down to the fact that the Marlins, uh, yes, they went in on Jose Abreu and they couldn't get a deal done. They they were one year light and maybe 15, 20 million short. Okay. Justin Turner, though, this is a different situation. This is why the spotlight focuses heavily onto this one. And why? What did Justin Turner do? He signed with the Red Sox. Okay. He signed a a two-year deal with an option. And if he opts out, the actual one-year deal um, ends up being, I think, 15 million in some in in that range. But the two years combined, I think it's 22 million. Seems a little bit complicated. And there was a little bit of um, duplication or misreporting in that area. Not really sure. We'll maybe have to dig into that. But fundamentally, Justin Turner signs with the Red Sox. And... He signed for a value and a length of term and a contract that in many ways, the Marlins, well, not in many ways, the Marlins did match it and likely exceeded that offer. So this didn't come down to JT, who's going to give you the most money? Where are you going to sign? Oh, it's the Marlins. Great. Pull, Pull the trigger on that one. Didn't come down to that. He ends up signing with the Boston Red Sox. Yes, the Boston Red Sox. Big name. Big history, big fan base, big market, all of those things. Um, a lot of uh, familiar friends as well, probably, because the, the Red Sox and, and Dodgers have done some business over the years, and it's not been that favorable to the Red Sox, it's fair to say. But let's be totally honest with the Red Sox. Where are they right now? Are they contending in the AL East? Who knows? I think that's a little bit unfair to kind of say they're a wash right now, but um, it's it's fair to say that they aren't favorites. Let's put it that way. They're not 
favored to win that division. They're probably not favorites or even fourth favorites. The Red Sox are likely not to win in 2023. They're likely not to compete heavily. You know, that, that division is competitive, so I have to be careful with that. It's not like the uh, maybe the Washington Nationals situation that are going to be so far off the pace. Like the Red Sox may finish fifth, but maybe seven games under 500. Is that good, bad, indifferent? It's better than the Marlins in, in terms of wins and losses. But this is why it starts to get interesting now, where on the face of it, you have more money offered on a team that perhaps is looking to make more noise than the Red Sox right now. Who knows if they will, but that's the offer. He's also, I, th I think he's a Dolphins fan. Like, I think, I don't know, there's some connection there with Florida. So anyway, Justin Turner ends up going to the Red Sox. And this is why from the Marlins fan base, the realization kicks in now. Free agency, not only do the Marlins not really want to spend and go after the studs, but also the middle tier, they don't want to come either because, well, for the reasons I mentioned, the, the numbers are suppressed. The fan base is it just, it's playing in a library. It's playing in empty ballparks. It's not fun for anyone. The Marlins have a serious problem on their hands now. Serious problem. Because, yes, you can talk about going after the, the three, 400 million contract of the fish, but... For the fish not even to be able to compete in the mid to low market, guys, that is a serious, serious problem. This type of organization, they have to try and find diamonds in the rough. Regularly, multiple diamonds in the rough, <laughs> year after year. And if they can't even acquire those diamonds, then, well, you have to turn to minor league free agents like, I guess, Garrett Hampson. Good example of that, actually. And for me, one of the best, best, best bets, <laughs> one of the best, Bits of business the Marlins have done, actually. I like I like that deal. Garrett Hampson, their former Rocky, signing on a, a minor league deal invitation to spring. Uh, it, we know it now. We'll see Garrett Hampson uh, in 23. We will. It was the same as uh, Williams Astadio. He signs, you know, minor league free agent, da-da-da. You know, within a month, they're up at the big club because injuries happen. And... You know, it's just the way the Marlins seem to play things. So we'll see Hampson. And I think that'll end up being quite a nice signing. And the, the other thing too around uh, Hampson is it then gives the Marlins the ability to actually move guys in year. So if 2023 goes sideways, we already know it. Miggy Rose expiring deal, as is Wendell, as is Garrett Cooper. So would have been Brian Anderson, but Brian Anderson's already gone. There's going to be a whole infield effectively that could be traded at the deadline or in advance of the deadline as the Marlins seek some return on those guys, whether that's now or towards the deadline. So a player like Hampson, you know, major league experience, a vet in many ways, could slot into that spot and take it. I think you're going to see a ton of Garrett Hampson in 2023. Really do. Didn't think I'd be talking as much about Garrett Hampson. So let's go back to the point in hand. Well, before we do that, let's let you know about our good friends over at Bet Online, guys. And, well, listen, who was betting on the football yesterday? And what I mean by the football is the World Cup, not the NFL, although the NFL was juicy as hell too. But if you were a betting man on that, uh, that World Cup, boy, oh boy, you would, have been, you would have been absolutely sweating through it, no doubt. What a stunner. I did see there was that one guy, that one dude, that what did he have, a, a seven-event a seven roll-up where the World Cup and France as the winner was the final event that he had. I think it was $25 down to win probably multiple millions or whatever it might have been. And he ended up cashing out. He cashed out on that 280 grand, I think, back. And he absolutely chose the right call because France did not win. Argentina taking it. Lionel getting it done. What a World Cup. Absolutely stunning. What does this have to do with Bet Online? I don't know. I don't know why I'm going off on this tangent, but it doesn't matter. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info. This. Get all the latest odds trends for every professional amateur league out there. Pro college. Pro college. Pro football, the basketball and World Cup. Well, the World Cup's done right now. Let's update this copy. Anyway, they've got it all at betonline.net. It's the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. Boy, oh boy, I wonder what the odds would have been. On the Marlins having made zero, zero major league, major league MLB level um, moves by the 19th of December. Zero free agents. 
I'm I'm still absolutely stunned that the Marlins are in this position. I truly am because the the reality is they should have been they have been talking about this since what mid July I would say that was kind of at the point where it became clear that 2022 wasn't going to be the one. Too many injuries, too much underperformance, and clearly 22 wasn't going to be the case. So you start fielding those trade offers, you get the momentum going. You then okay, we're not we don't have to pull the trigger on these guys. Let's you know wait until the off season. We're in the off season now, and I, I think it's I think the the thing that we have to be careful of here is the fact that the season is still a, a few months away. So it isn't like we're at opening day and the Marlins have done absolutely zero. So I do I'm taking the positives there that Kim's called it out. We're going to upgrade some sticks and they haven't managed to, to make it happen yet. And Craig Mish talked about it a little bit yesterday on Twitter in a an exchange, I'll, I'll call it, where we're saying maybe Kim and the, and the club are maybe looking to try and find the perfect deal, the perfect trade. And I get that. And you're trying to find the best deal for your club. Absolutely. Uh, and that's clearly the, that should be the objective or the vision, perhaps. It's the vision of trading is to find the best possible deal or the perfect trade. Sometimes they aren't always possible. They aren't. And I'm very intrigued to see the way the next few months turn out in terms of the direction they take from a free agency perspective, like who's fundamentally left. And this team has so many holes and it can't be filled by one or two trades of some, of some, you know, starting depth. Sign free agents to supplement what they've got. And the problem they're facing is who's left? Talk about Brandon Drury, et cetera. Um, I, I've not been a, the biggest fan of Drury, but at the same time, like it's thinning out quick. He probably would be an upgrade at third base, but he's coming off a career year where he was playing Yaddy. We know what the numbers jump like in Cincinnati. We know what the numbers decline to in, in Miami. Brandon Drury, on the face of it, you've got to go back probably a, a few years and, and maybe average it out rather than looking at a career year in 22 and expecting that as the baseline. A, that isn't the baseline. And B, when you come into Miami, the baseline will, your baseline is quicksand. The history is quicksand. It'll quickly disappear. And the Marlins will end up with a, a guy that they end up signing on, you know, one year, 10 million deal will not be great and will underperform, probably. At the heart of it, though, the question that I started with, and I think we have to ask it, is whether or what's the point at, at this point for the Marlins? Because right now, the they aren't you know, they've missed out on the on the best guys, free agent wise. There's not one single trade that they can make to to get themselves in, into contention. This team this team lost 69 games. Sorry, this team won 69 games in 22. To get to the postseason, they need to win us, I would say. And, you know, it'll vary year on year, but let's just say, um, let's say it's 85 wins. That is a massive jump that they need to make. Massive jump in 2023 to get into contention. And what I don't want to hear is we're, we're shooting for a 500 season. Let's let's just kind of strip that away for for you know what it is and just say that's basically the Marlin shooting for a year where they missed the postseason. That's another year where Sandy Alcantara and the jewel of a stud rotation is wasted. It's wasted. There's no 500 ball is as good as 400 ball, 300 ball. Actually, the way baseball works, that ball is more valuable. Play worse. 500 is nowhere. There's no point shooting for 500. You have to shoot for 85 to 90 wins. You have to. And the point that I was thinking about was, I'm not convinced that they have that in them right now. I'm not convinced that that's going to happen this year. And let's look ahead to next year, guys. You've got three, maybe four starting offensive guys that are going to be free agents. And who are they? It's the three I mentioned earlier, Miggy, Wendell, Coop, plus, in my opinion, Jorge Soler will opt out. So that's four guys that likely will start on opening day in some capacity, perhaps opening weekend will start and will be gone 
for 24. And that means they've not only got tons to supplement now, but they've then got to do the same again next offseason. This roster is in such a transition transitional period. There's so much work to do. Remains so much work. And I'm just not convinced they can do it. And each year that they don't, the value starts to disappear from Sandy Alcantara, Pablo Lopez, Jesus Lozado, Trevor Rogers, Braxton Garrett. The value starts to disappear. If you're shooting for seasons that are 500 or best, don't bother. It's a waste of time. When I was listening to uh, David Sampson on with, uh, on, on with Isaac and, and KB and, and Eli, one of the things that, that really stood out to me and stuck out with me is, you know, that David, David called it out and said, we just, we played 500 ball or I can't remember the exact language, but basically what he's saying is we played 500 ball for too long. 500 ball in baseball is no good. It's no good. It's actually the worst result possible. Worst result. Don't make the postseason and you're not, you're not poor enough to end up scooping up one of the top five guys in the draft. And that's a whole nother topic, whether actually the Marlins can, can turn that into value. But let's assume that they could, and it is a valuable position to be in. But I want the expectations to be higher. When I saw the Marlins just targeting Justin Turner, Michael A. T Michael a. Taylor, um, who else are they talking about? Um, Michael Conforto. These guys, they're not needle movers. They're not going to drastically change things for the Marlins. Yes, they'll maybe enhance what they have, right now, but they're not pushing them to 85 to 90 wins. So what's the point? What is the point in that approach? For me, there is none. There is none. The fans aren't going to all of a sudden turn up turn up in their droves if they're on the cusp of having a 500 year. It's not going to happen. It isn't. So what really needs to be asked right now is, is this ownership ever going to invest in this team to a level that gets them to 85 to 90 wins? And if it isn't, then you may as well blow it up now and put us out of our misery. <laughs> you may as well do it, which is sad to say. It's sad to say because, and I've said this on last week's episodes and probably multiple weeks, you're probably tired of hearing it from me, but it has to be said. They've done the hard work. They have got the rotation done. It's the hardest part to do. It's the most expensive part to do. They've done it. They have done it. For whatever reason now, they can't supplement the offense. And why can't they supplement it? Because they're not willing to overpay because they're snake bitten from last year. They don't actually want to come to play in Miami because it's going to suppress the numbers and hurt them in the future. The Marlins are in a really, really tricky spot. I actually have no idea how they get out of it. I don't. But the next few months is going to be wildly intriguing to see what the Marlins do. But the fact that they're here on the 19th of December, having added zero major leaguers to a 69 roster, blows my mind. The optics are poor. There is still time. There is still time. And I know the Marlins are trying to enhance. They're trying to get a deal done for a starting pitcher. So what you have to do is, and I get this, it makes sense. You have to let the, the starting pitching play out. I think we're there now. I think with Rodon going, the upper level guys are gone. So clubs that are seeking twos and threes, they have to look at trades now. They have to look at trades. That then brings the Marlins into play. So I get it. I think that's the one thing we should all keep in our minds. The fact that from a trade perspective, they had to let the free agent market play out. Because let's take the Yankees as a great example here with, with Rodon, where the Yankees, to acquire Pablo Lopez, and it, you know you may look at Rodon and Pablo and go, I prefer one or the other. Let's say you see them evenly in terms of players, and you then follow it through. So for the Yankees, to acquire Pablo Lopez, they would have had to have sent, let's say they would have had to have sent um, Gleyber Torres or Peraza and another prospect that was near Major League ready. Two guys out of your organization and you get Pablo Lopez. May have been a good trade. However, the other, the other, go to free agency, 
sign the player. So you get the player, add them in, and well, lo and behold, you've just had to pay some money, but no guys are leaving your organization. You're not getting, but you're adding. That's what the Marlins should be doing. But unfortunately, they're not doing that. But going back to it, because I'll go off on another tangent and we're running out of time. The free agent market has played out for the pitching side. So it's now time for Kim to cook. It is. Now is the time for Kim to absolutely cook and to make a deal. There's, I put it out there on Twitter. Which teams need pitching? Pretty much everyone was saying everyone needs pitching. Everyone does. Who's selling pitching? I don't think anyone's selling. The Marlins have cornered the market. The Marlins pretty much are the only team selling pitching studs right now. And every team needs them. I've never experienced trading conditions as favorable as this for the Marlins. The, the, the conditions are perfect. Everyone is buying. You can play everyone off against each other and drive the price up. Kim, it's time to cook. I am very, very intrigued to see what happens. The Marlins, they have to make some moves. And they will make a move or two with the trades. We have to give it time. And I understand why it needs to take time. On the flip side, though, we have missed out on the free agents. And it hurts Kim, Bruce, the team, all of us, when we have to acknowledge the fact that players don't want to come and play to Miami. Offensive guys, they don't want to come. They'll only come if you way overpay or if I'm just about to retire and it's a, a farewell tour. That hurts. And that has to change. How it changes, we're going to talk about the future. That's me out of here for Monday the 19th. Thanks for making Locked on Marlins your first listener of the day. I, of course, am your host, Peter Pratt. Don't forget to follow me, of course, on Twitter at Miami Marlins underscore UK. This podcast now, in the main, reduces down a little bit. Um, the minimum requirement is three episodes per week. But I'm going to play it by ear. And so, you know, likely we'll keep the volume up as the Marlins hopefully remain active. And also, over the festive period... Uh, I've got my good friend Matt Williams coming on the show who came on last year and we did a big deep dive on Jazz Chisholm Jr. Um, and we're going to do a similar type of thing, but we're going to dig into, we're going to spend multiple episodes, multiple players digging into, uh, I think, Brian De La Cruz. Could Brian De La Cruz be real? Jesus Cesado, can he repeat again? Trevor Rogers, Patsy, a bounce back. Pablo Lopez, there's so many different guys to get into. But just to kind of signpost that one, let you know it's coming down the chute. Likely, I'll try and sprinkle episodes across the Christmas break, Christmas Day, Boxing Day, etc., um, to give you guys some content. Listen, I'm in the kitchen. I'm doing the main cooking uh, for my family on Christmas Day. I need content too. So I'm going to do it, pre-record them, and put them out there so you guys have got something covered, Marlins-wise, uh, and things to be excited about. Like, we should be excited to dig into Brian De La Cruz's September. We should be excited to talk about Jesus Cesado's pretty much his whole year. We should be excited to think about whether Trevor Rogers can bounce back or what his trade value could be, maybe if you look at it that way, um, in terms of 2022 and, and, and what went wrong. But for now, guys, thanks for joining me. And I will be back tomorrow, likely with Sean Barrett, because he missed last week because that was my fault as well. But likely Sean will be back in the hot seat tomorrow. And hopefully we'll see some new rumors emerging in terms of who the Marlins are targeting and whether they're going to get any trades done this side of Christmas. See you then, guys.